Good evening, everyone. My name is Cameron Kazar, Marketing Manager for Randall Rally's Trucking Media Group. Welcome to our webinar in, entitled Keeping Up with Driver Pay. Tonight, our guest speaker will be Gordon Klump, head of the National Transportation Institute. He will share newly released, detailed second quarter compensation data from more than 350 key carriers. We would also like to thank Rider Vehicle Sales and Shell Rotella for their sponsorship of this webinar. And with that, I'll turn it over to Randy Greider, Overdrive Editor. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, I would also like to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest, Gordon Klimp. Gordon is the founder and president of the National Transportation Institute. Many of you are familiar with his National Survey of Driver Wages, the National Major Fleet Driver Benefit Report, and other compensatory analyses. We look forward to forward to hearing from Gordon as he shares the latest compensation data from more than 300 key carriers. Welcome, Gordon. Good evening, Randy. Thank you for the gracious introduction. Um, I look forward to uh, uh, not only uh, discussing uh, what we found this quarter, but also uh, taking questions afterwards. So uh, please feel free to ask uh, questions on any subject we talk about here. Um, Hopefully everybody's seeing my screen now and um, just wanted to run through some of the things we were going to uh, uh, talk about here this evening. Uh, first, the economic uh, environment. Uh, we wanted to touch on that this evening because it certainly is driving everything that happens or doesn't happen with uh, driver and owner-operator pay and compensation. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge animal in the, uh, in the house right now and uh, we're going to have to keep our eye on it to uh, be able to make good predictions about what's likely to happen with uh, our driver uh, pay rates and uh, benefits. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the supply of company drivers and uh, owner-operator supply also. Um, that's also a critical issue, uh, not only right now, but, uh, but going forward. Uh, we're going to touch uh, on the uh, driver pay as uh, we see it at the end of the second quarter. Uh, of this year, and uh, it's interesting to look at. I think you'll find uh, some surprises in it and uh, some things that might not surprise you, but uh, it is, uh, I think, very interesting uh, look at uh, what's happened in the first half of the year. And we're going to uh, then take a look at things to watch because we, uh, we think there's a lot of things that are likely to happen in uh, the future as we move forward in this uh, pay environment and uh, some of them uh, we think we see the leading edge of uh, right now, so uh, we'll talk about that. And lastly, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up and uh, take your questions, and um, also uh, give you an email address if you uh, just want to shoot me an email. If something comes up afterwards or you didn't get a chance to answer a question, I can uh, just respond to your email. Where do we get our data? Uh, oftentimes that uh, it comes up in the questions. I'll try to head that one off, and Randy touched on it. We, we do a quarterly update of a 350 benchmark pay packages, and we track about 65 different attributes for owner-operators and company drivers. And while that sounds like a lot, when you actually break down all the things that make up uh, uh, driver compensation and benefits, uh, it strings right out there at about 65 different elements. So we touch on mileage pay, percentage pay, uh, bonuses, qualifications uh, in terms of uh, age and tractors, uh, all, the, all the things that go into that. And then over on the benefit side, be it uh, an owner operator getting uh, uh, paid, plates paid for or a company driver uh, having a, an insurance uh, premium every month. We touch uh, all those things with our research. Um, we break the uh, packages down and organize them by owner-operators, company drivers, uh, then into dry vans, refrigerated flatbeds, and tanks. We are uh, not going to uh, um, have a slide this evening on tanks because it's a relatively small area in our research. Uh, but if uh, someone is interested in tanks, please feel free to uh, ask a question about that. Um, just didn't want to take up uh, any room in the presentation with uh, such a small section of uh, our research. Um, we also gather uh, data from our driver benefit survey uh, that we do on an annual basis, and we also do a semi-annual qualifications uh, survey, what, uh, what their uh, qualifications 
expectations in the industry are how they're changing for both owner operators and uh, company drivers. Um, we now do a national supply and demand report by market that takes a look at uh, all the major markets and uh, what was the demand for drivers this week and uh, what was the uh, amount of that that was uh, filled and what's left unfilled. Uh, and we do a uh, national fuel surcharge monitor um, and uh, student trainer pay and uh, I guess we duplicated that. Um, we only do one of those reports. Um, where we're going to start is the economic keys. Uh, unfortunately, while uh, maybe up to about the first half of this year, it looked like we were uh, getting a little bit of growth out of the economy a bit slow. Uh, the economic indicators right now are looking pretty tough. We, we have a really anemic job growth. Uh, and all this speaks to the fact uh, what's going to happen in terms of freight available. Um, but anemic job growth, we're hanging in there at 0.2% unemployment, um, but we also, as far as uh, the number of jobs for uh, uh, people are finding each week, we're running uh, uh, behind recently in terms of just what it takes to fill the people that are coming in uh, to the workforce as uh, entry-level employees each month, so that's not a good sign. Uh, consumer sentiment, uh, which reflects a lot of uh, what's going to happen with consumer spending, which in turn reflects a lot of what's going to get hauled, um, is still uh, low. We have a pretty low confidence level, level out there among uh, the consumers. The manufacturing sector, uh, while it is still technically growing, uh, it has been weakening in the last few reports. Uh, we don't like to see that. Um, and the business confidence index is weak. Um, primarily, and I think we all all know why. There's just so much uncertainty in making business decisions today because we have many uh, many areas that impact costs that are uh, just unknown. And uh, as we probably all know, and many of that are on our operators out there know, you have to make your decision at the fringe. What's the outside? What's the worst thing that can happen here? And uh, prepare for that. And uh, overall, businesses are doing that, uh, maintaining. Uh, profitability, but uh, not investing much money into uh, the economy right now. So um, we remain concerned about uh, that and what it means about uh, freight levels uh, in months to come. The European debt crisis, well, uh, it doesn't seem like uh, it should affect us. The uh, fact of the matter is it does affect us. Uh, we're tied uh, both uh, to the uh, export-import market. Uh, Europe's our, our second largest market. Uh, so demand diminishing there uh, affects our manufacturing and our trade and in turn our, uh, our hauling. And uh, our banking system is uh, tied to theirs uh, pretty closely. So uh, when their banks are in trouble, we're going to catch a certain amount of that by, uh, uh, by association. So all in all, um, you know, all the signs right now appear to be fairly negative. Now, uh, there have been some better signs in the housing industry, um, but generally the ones that are going to drive the economy right now are, are still up in the air. Uh, and I suspect not much will get settled till, uh we'll get the November elections out of the way. So we have a few more months of uncertainty. Um, but the, the good news is uh, we still have uh, almost more than enough uh, freight to haul. The bad news is that the, the shipper uh, leverage on uh, negotiating prices and carriers leverage on raising prices are essentially at an equilibrium level right now, which means we simply aren't seeing any uh, rate increases, and rate increases uh, increase to in, translate to increased driver pay, whether you're paid by the mile or you're paid by percentage. Um, the only difference is when you get it, because uh, carriers, I think, are willing to pay if they can get rates to go higher. Um, let's talk about the driver and owner-operator uh, supply-demand situation right now. Uh, the key factors we see in the supply of uh, drivers and owner-operators right now on the company driver's side, it comes down to retirements. We have a, a tremendous uh, number of people who have retired uh, over the last uh, decade. Uh, and in fact, uh, of the driver force that we had in place in uh, 2000, 
uh, roughly 36% of them uh, will be retired by the end of this year. Uh, that's a huge number to replace. And uh, we know that uh, during the years 2000, um, last half of 2007, 8, 9, uh, and into 2010, we essentially replaced none of them. We were actually shedding drivers. And, uh, well, we brought back uh, quite a number of those drivers into the workforce. The reality is we, we lost about a third of them, and right now we don't have a good feeder system that is uh, bringing lots and lots of uh, new drivers into uh, our uh, uh, carriers and uh, seating them in trucks and uh, uh, allowing them to make a, uh, a good living driving a truck. Um, one of the problems there is that uh, second check mark, and that is that we have a shrinking key driver uh, demographic, and uh, in the last uh, 12 years, it's uh, shrunk about three and a half million people uh, in that demographic, and it's uh, that democratic demographic that runs from about 35 to 54, and uh, people who uh, have always been prime targets to in that age group start to move towards truck driving and the, the group as a whole is, is shrunk about three and a half million people um, and that's not a, a good sign for recruiting it means we're going to have to as an industry get a lot more inventive about how we bring non-traditional driver candidates uh, into the industry and put them in trucks and get them interested in careers that uh, will make them uh, uh, good money and uh, a great career, um, but it's kind of non-traditional um, in terms of the, the group that they uh, uh, occupy, if you are, are part of. Um, we also have some issues in terms of we have increasingly difficult qualification standards. On the margins of, of people who have uh, filled out a driving course over the years, uh, Many of those uh, candidates or candidates like them can no longer qualify given the more rigorous standards that uh, are in place in terms of uh, onboarding a driver, uh, both the standards that are driven by federal regulations and standards that are driven by um, the fact that it becomes increasingly uh, more costly for a carrier uh, not to have the uh, uh, the safest, most confident uh, drivers out there. It's more than just hauling a load. It's uh, doing a very safe and efficient manner. Uh, and those qualifi qualifications uh, eliminate uh, a lot of people from, from the industry. In fact, when you go back to the years uh, 2008, 9, and into 10, well, we still had, uh, we shed a lot of drivers. We had a lot of them in the, the pool. Uh, many of those people who are still in that pool are people who simply don't qualify uh, given today's uh, standards. Um, we have another problem um, and it reflects in, in company drivers and that is that take home pay today uh, plus or minus 5% of, of what drivers were making in most cases back in 2007. Uh, and while we have had pay increases, uh, the reality is, and you'll see this in our graphs, We're going to give Gordon just a second, see if we can get him back online. Yeah, yeah back. Apologies. Wonderful. So let's just pick up. You were talking, uh, we were into talking about the uh, the take-home pay, how there's been increases, but I guess I think you were going to talk about compared to the uh, right. cost of living, maybe. So I'm going to let you pick up there. Okay. Uh, first, my apologies. I'm having some uh, phone problems uh, tonight, and uh, my apologies for getting uh, blown away there. So, um, I was on the uh, point that uh, plus or minus 5% uh, is where most drivers are today, uh, with most of them taking a haircut in between uh, 2007 and uh, last year. And uh, so, we've got uh, a ways to build, and that created an atmosphere where we lost a lot of drivers to alternate forms of employment uh, because wages were going down. And when you count your, uh, particularly for uh, any driver, the cost of living on the road is uh, much more expensive than uh, being at home every night. And, uh, so uh, the fact that pay hasn't bounced back uh, strongly yet 
overall is uh, still an issue we, we have to deal with. Um, and my apologies, it's probably just blown up all the way. Um, and um, the other is alternative employment. Uh, a lot of people had to do something uh, when driving jobs weren't available. Uh, they've strung that together with uh, part-time jobs and uh, are making it go. And uh, they're home all the time, and uh, they don't appear to want to come back into uh, the driver workforce uh, and join us again, uh, which is uh, disappointing. Uh, but right now, the numbers uh, don't encourage them uh, to do that. So those are, are some issues. And by the way, when you listen to the weekly numbers, literally week after week, while we're not creating very many uh, full-time jobs, uh, we are creating a lot of part-time jobs. And, uh, and have been all through this downturn. So um, therein lies uh, uh, something that's uh, happening to uh, potential drivers that uh, they are tied up in uh, part-time and uh, substitute employment and uh, have not rejoined us. Owner-operators, uh, we've lost um, about the same number of owner-operators for retirement. Uh, owner-operators in many cases are, are, are forced uh, to make a decision between staying in the industry and uh, you know, changing the relationship with the carrier to a lease purchase uh, simply because of the scoring equipment costs, uh, the fact that it's so staggeringly expensive to buy a new truck, uh, the cost of regulation isn't going to get any cheaper on them either. So long term, that looks like a, a real problem for us. There's also a uh, little no credit availability out there if uh, you're an owner-operator. It's, it's really, really tough to uh, borrow money for your uh, needed equipment. And uh, the last thing down there, it's uh, pretty similar to that take-home pay uh, for owner-operators, but uh, the disappearing risk premium for being an owner-operator. Uh, you have uh, issues right now as an owner-operator that uh, your uh, take-home uh, has been tougher and tougher to maintain and your expenses go up um, and it's reached the point of uh, uh, being very difficult to increase your take home and that risk premium for owning it and uh, managing it and all those things is uh, uh, going away. But the good news is that we have uh, a lot of people who have aggressive uh, programs out there to uh, put you in a lease and uh, they're able to own a truck again and using uh, uh, carrier's credit and uh, availability of credit. So, uh, but it does really uh, be one of those things in the end that's going to continue to restrict the supply of uh, owner-operators and company drivers. Um, we also have, at the same time, working against us in terms of, uh, you know, as an industry having a full complement of drivers, uh, we've got things that are uh, driving down uh, productivity. Uh, and those things are, uh, and productivity and supply of drivers, uh, two things are happening at one time. Uh, CSA, uh, right now about 6% of all drivers are deficient in one or more of the basic scores. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, they're all going to quit driving, but some percentage of those people will wind up uh, failing uh, to stay eligible uh, through CSA. Uh, we also have a lot of administrative uh, issues that tie people up and take some of them out of the workforce uh, unnecessarily. Uh, things like uh, the data queue appeals process right now. Um, it doesn't work. Uh, there are several uh, items uh, related to CSA that uh, are sidelining drivers because uh, they need to be tweaked. Um, you know, the idea is right, but the process isn't working. And so that's an issue. Uh, we see uh, things like uh, hair follicle testing. Um, while there's a relatively small number of, of carriers that are using uh, hair follicle testing right now, it's growing uh, every month. And the ones that are using it are the trendsetters. Um, the cost has dropped uh, since it was uh, conceived and, and put out there in the industry for us to use. Uh, so that the cost, while it's a little bit higher, it's, it's not prohibited anymore. Uh, it does allow you to go back in, uh, in time far enough that uh, you've got a pretty good idea that uh, you're getting a clean driver uh, when you use that. 
Um, the uh, the feds have it on their radar. Uh, they know it. It's just not there right now to uh, to act on. Um, they've got other things on their plate right now. But uh, rest assured, uh, they'll probably get to it. However, uh, insurance companies may well um, force the issue uh, before that, uh, simply saying that, uh, you know, in terms of uh, insurance claims, uh, we simply don't want to go to court with uh, anyone who has a history um, that we should have known about uh, that's been involved in an accident. So, you know, uh, they could easily insist that her follicle testing become part of the uh, ongoing criterion for onboarding a driver. Um, our estimate is, uh, from talking to uh, uh, people using it, it, it could take 5 to 10 percent of the applicant uh, pool and disqualify it. Um, I know that people have been using it for uh, a period of time right now. Uh, they're experiencing uh, rejection rates in the 3 percent uh, range, but they start in the 5 to 6 percent range. And depending on how well you screen your, your applicants coming in, um, you know, in some some cases that's as high as 10. Um, so it's it's another pressure on um, the pool. Uh, we're going to have less people uh, available uh, to recruit. Um, hours of service, uh, who knows what it will end up looking like in the end. What we know is it probably isn't going to add anything to productivity. Uh, driver's productivity may take away 8 to 10 percent. Uh, that's a ballpark we're using now. So what we're describing here is that we have federal regulations that are a drag on, on productivity and uh, combined with uh, the fact we're already short continues to make the potential for a real uh, driver shortage uh, more real uh, and likely worse than we can imagine because right now we're in a very uh, modest period of growth and uh, everybody's still looking for drivers. So if we had an economy that uh, took off and grew at 3 or 4% a year, uh, we'd be hurting overnight on drivers really bad. Um, what do we need to do um, to address some of those things? And it's not going to put some of them up without addressing them. Uh, we need a lot better retention management. Unfortunately, right now we're seeing uh, growth and turnover again, and that's uh, the most costly thing we have in the industry uh, is the uh, pressure when, when drivers move and uh, simply rearrange their employment situation. And Because when it gets to be 50 plus percent, uh, it's very expensive for everybody. Uh, we need to get better recruiting students, building drivers, find new ones to come in. We need to continue to engineer, re-engineer the job. And we're, when we talk about pay tonight, we're going to talk about the uh, OTR numbers. Uh, but frankly, industry has done a, a really good job of re-engineering in terms of having a lot more regional uh, home or off jobs available today. And lastly, uh, pay is going to have to continue to improve. We're going to attract and retain uh, the people that we want uh, driving trucks in this industry. Um, so where's driver pay now? Um, and those of you that are drivers out there, I know the answer not high enough. Uh, and I think uh, most people in the industry would uh, would agree with you. Uh, we're going to look at flatbeds, uh, dry vans, and refrigerated night. And uh, we're going to start on the company driver side here. And uh, we're using a, a solo coming in with uh, five years of experience. And uh, clearly, I just put it out to 2,000. Um, so we had a, a, a dozen years to look at. But we can see coming into uh, uh, that, that first decade of the century that we had a, a dip uh, in demand and a dip in pay. Uh, then in two, late 2004, we took off like a rocket, and uh, wages just went uh, way up because uh, we were able to get off any freight rate we wanted. And um, times were were very good. Uh, they flattened out in 2006-07. Uh, uh, then for dry vans, we took a dip, uh, a pretty sizable one, not only losing mileage, but uh, seeing uh, pay rates uh, come down in, in a lot of cases. And then uh, beginning in 2010, we started to watch those uh, come up. What we've seen in the uh, last six months of this year is about a three-tenths of a cent gain overall. So we've gone from 
about 36.1 cents uh, to 36.4 on the average uh, through June. So three tenths of a cent uh, equals you know a little bit over a half cent a year. Uh, certainly not a, a, a big gain in pay for drivers yet. If you look at the red up there, uh, we track the spread. Uh, it's it's a, a bottom group and a top group, um, and it's up to about 15 and a half cents now. Uh, middle of last year was at about 14 uh, cents, so it's grown about a penny and a half. The reason we think that number is important is because uh, that mark, our market tends to be a chase market in that we have a lot of people um, hold off and then all of a sudden those people tend to be in the bottom quartile of uh, at least the bottom half of payers and all of a sudden uh, it takes off on the bottom and uh, we think the pressure there equates to get back into a normal relationship is about four and a half cents. But what sets that off is always freight and uh, demand for drivers. So freight, freight at good rates, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll set it off. And, and we could see it moving four and a half cents whenever we get the right conditions there. Um, and unfortunately, the right conditions are not not uh, here at this time. On the flatbed side, we take a look at uh, what happened, and, and we go back to. Uh, 2005-06, we see flatbeds got hit uh, hard and they got hit first, um, took a big dip, and uh, they're up this year about four tenths of a cent, um, which is, you know, equates to about eight tenths on the year, um, and that market uh, seems to be, uh, be pretty strong. It's got a 12 cent spread. Uh, and we see the, the bottom pressure with the money. If the market were to correct itself all at one time, it, it'd move about two, 2.6 cents. Um, so that is a, uh, uh, a market that has been uh, growing more aggressively uh, than um, the uh, drive-in market, and uh, it's, uh, it's moved uh, the pay four tenths of a cent versus uh, a pretty modest uh, one on, on the other side, given uh, the difference in uh, 15 and a half cent spread and the 12 cent spread. So, um, refrigerated, uh, we take a look at those. Uh, took a dip at the first part of uh, the first decade, uh, came up, and, and frankly, didn't take the pay dip. Uh, you know, miles may have been down a little bit, but refrigerated drivers, um, they held their pay together and uh, this year, we've seen it bump up uh, about a tenth of a cent, so uh, pretty modest, although I can tell you that there's some uh, pay uh, changes announced um, for uh, in August that are going to affect uh, some carriers, so we expect the second half of the year uh, to refrigerate it to see it move up a little more aggressively than it uh, did in the first half of the year. Um, I thought rather than boring you with all graphs, we would do the owner operators a little bit differently. And uh, so went through, and uh, by the way, if you add up the percentages that they don't uh, add up to 100 in all cases, uh, primarily because we uh, have some outliers on these, we look for, for grouping. So in group one and on the owner operator vans right now for people paying percentage, uh, the group one pay falls in the uh, 90 to 93 cent range. Uh, we found about 53 percent of uh, the drivers uh, in that category uh, or carriers in that that category. <coughs> Excuse me. And for all the categories, it didn't. They weren't. Uh, the deadhead pay doesn't uh, change a lot, and deadhead pay uh, ranges all the way from uh, 50 cents a, a mile up to uh, uh, you know loaded rates. So. Um, it was uh, not sensitive to this grouping. Um, the group two, um, about a quarter of the uh, folks out there in that 94 to 97 cent uh, range, and group three was uh, 98 to about two. And so those rates are, uh, are definitely getting, uh, getting stronger. Uh, the thing that keeps the whole industry from ratcheting up a little bit more uh, is the fact that uh, a lot of people haven't moved, and so um, while we see those um, 
populations move up that chain a little bit, uh, we'll see a little more growth than uh, van owner operator pay. Um, on the flatbed side, uh, we did two groups of uh, per mile pay and then also uh, percentage pay because it's, uh, as you know, very popular. Uh, for the folks that are paying uh, by the mile, about 60% uh, of them, 61% uh, fell in a 93 to uh, 96 cent range per mile. Um, excuse me. And uh, the second group uh, was 97 to uh, to a dollar a mile, and uh, a little bit over a, uh, a third, short of 40 percent. So uh, about 98 percent of them uh, fell into the that 93 uh, cent to a dollar range. Looks like uh, we are again experiencing a little bit of difficulty here. Hopefully we'll get him back in uh, just a moment. Uh, the group three pairs uh, were percentage pairs and uh, they primarily fall in a range of 70% uh, to 75% uh, on the flatbed owner operators. Uh, there are some as high as 83, and uh, as you know, there's lots of uh, uh, tweaks to uh, to get it that high in terms of uh, you know oftentimes owning the trailer as well as uh, the tractor. So um, that is uh, movement, uh, but uh, once again. Uh, it will go higher as uh, both drivers continue to be short and uh, if we can continue to get some economic uh, recovery after uh, um, the, uh, the election, we'll, uh, we'll be able to uh, see maybe uh, those numbers go quite a bit higher, which are, are definitely warranted. Refrigerated owner operators. Um, we did uh, three groups there, um, and as a matter of fact, as you know, there's not a lot of percentage pay on uh, the refrigerated side for owner operators. But uh, the rate start is uh, low as 84 cents, and uh, <clears throat> there's a, a group that's 84 cents to uh, 89 cents, about a 38 percent. Oftentimes, those uh, lower numbers that uh, uh, 84 cent uh, number is uh, pretty high mileage runs, uh, you know, a thousand miles or more. Um, and so um, there's always some caveats when you, you look at that and say, gee, that looks awfully low. It does, but, uh, you know, on 1,500 mile runs, it, uh, it can work out. Uh, group two uh, fell into 90 to 94 cent uh, range. About 39% of folks fell in there. And, uh, Group three, 95 uh, to a dollar, and uh, about 19% there. Uh, one thing certainly to uh, to note in refrigerated, and, um, and uh, I think Mark's doing a, a really uh, good job in terms of leading how they're doing uh, detention pay, and that is guaranteeing it and uh, working hard with their shippers to, uh, um, you know, get it collected. Um, but we are seeing... Uh, uh, more people uh, with uh, better detention uh, wait time programs for drivers on the refrigerated side than, uh, than ever before. And so um, there's lots of uh, good things happening there. Um, and those rates, while well, they, they haven't moved a whole lot, um, I think in the second half we'll see uh, them move a little bit more than they have in the past. Um, but the miles have been consistent, and uh, it's been nice to have a job through a few of these uh, last years. Um, looking forward, uh, one of the things that we certainly see is that uh, an increasing bond between uh, carriers and owner operators in terms of uh, financing, uh, you know, helping them with business support tools, um, making those things uh, available um, as, as part of their uh, uh, deductions package. Um, and I'm talking about things like uh, American Truck Business Systems where you help the owner operate with a standard business PRL uh, so that they can benchmark themselves and uh, know on what they need to work on to, to stay a highly productive uh, owner operator. And uh, the last thing down there um, is there'll probably be a, a whole lot of options out there in terms of uh, 
uh, ways to pay that we haven't thought of as we go forward. We are seeing some of them uh, in terms of uh, some of the first uh, CSA bonuses. Um, you know, every uh, quarter, 30,000 miles, or, you know, whatever the interval is that uh, uh, some people are making uh, payments to uh, uh, owner-operators for uh, clean uh, uh, CSA records. And uh, uh, that is a, uh, a trend that's going to grow. Uh, we've also seen some uh, uh, pay options that include uh, some productivity measures that aren't uh, traditional. Um, yeah, uh, quite a bit of it uh, emerging really on the company driver side, which probably uh, uh, will emerge. But some of it will no doubt be a pop appropriate for uh, owner operators as well. So uh, we see that uh, moving forward. Uh, last thing I didn't put down, but it's a, to some degree a summary of what we've seen is that given the fact we're at a period of time where we have um, a very um, stagnant uh, economy, and we're looking for dri uh, drivers and owner-operators now uh, to, uh, to haul the freight that's available. As we move forward, we're probably looking at a very uh, challenging uh, environment in terms of uh, hiring drivers in the industry, which probably for uh, owner-operators and company drivers who might be listening in. Um, also, uh, it's going to be good for uh, uh, freight rates and in terms of uh, your pay. And uh, we are uh, uh, pleased to see uh, that we'll probably get to a point someday where uh, retention is a whole lot of an issue, uh, less of an issue. Um, you know, what's the magic number for attracting uh, uh, better driver candidates, better owner operators, and larger quantities through the industry? Um, I always look at um, the private fleets, we do a private fleet study, and um, the median uh, pay there, 67400 for a um, company driver, um, and uh, you know, look at that number, and it's quite a bit higher than where we are, um, and that's probably in the neighborhood of where we need to get to. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it may need to be higher than that in terms of... Um, uh, being maybe mid 70s, um, but it's clear that we can't do that on today's freight rates. Um, so, as uh, freight rates improve, uh, I think there's a lot of upside in terms of pay for uh, people that are in the industry, and uh, I'm convinced carriers are, are happy to pay as long as the, the rates are there. Um, people that are fall into that category in that. Uh, median private fleet, you know, they have uh, less than 15% uh, turnover historically. Um, they still tend to get more applications and they've got jobs and they, they attract people from other industries uh, much better than we historically have uh, in the rest of the industry. So uh, that's a significant number right now. Uh, I think it's someplace in the upper, uh, upper 60s to lower 70s where we start to break through and uh, really attract a lot of candidates to uh, the jobs we have. Um, questions? Oh, uh, okay, Gordon, we're going to turn it over to Cameron for just one minute before we do that. I think she had one more thing to address, and then we'll yep. get to our questions. So, Cameron? Thank you so much, Gordon. Um, before we open it up for questions, um, I would like to uh, read the following from our second sponsor, Shell Rotella. And they want you to know, no matter how hot, cold, steep, dusty, or muddy your driving conditions, you demand protection. Shell Rotella Energized Protection Heavy Duty Engine Rolls are formulated with unique adaptive technology, adapting physically or chemically to meet the ever-changing needs of your engine and releasing energy for, for the protection. Protection is a provided in three critical areas. Acid control, helping protect against corrosion from acids formed as fuel burns and as oil ages. Deposit control, helping keep engine clean for optimum performance and long life. And lastly, wear control, helping keep 
moving metal engine surfaces apart for long life. Shell Rotella, the engine oil that works as hard as you do. All right. Thank you, Cameron. Um, we're about to get started with the questions. And, and Gordon, I want to thank you for uh, to seeming so seamless tonight with the, with the problems on the technical side we have. You were able to pick right back up and uh, put out some really great information. And uh, We apologize to everyone, but it looks like uh, much of our audience has stayed with us, and we do appreciate that. All right, uh, Gordon, uh, the first question that we've got uh, uh, just one second. Oh, okay. Uh, are, are the owner-operators in the lower pay compensation groups that you outlined in the different segments, are, the reason are they are they in that lower group of compensation? Is it, is it because they're newer drivers, or what do you attribute that to? Well, in some cases, uh, some of those lower numbers are people that have um, pretty aggressive programs about uh, turning people into owner-operators. And, you know, take a company driver, turn them into an owner-operator, bring in somebody, put them through CEO training, uh, put them in a company truck for a short period of time, move them into a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a lease purchase program. And uh, they have uh, oftentimes, uh, with those lower numbers too, they have some pretty high mileage uh, runs they're putting them on. So uh, the low numbers come there. But, yeah, part of it is because they've been uh, – they're kind of just moving through the first part of the system, and uh, somebody's going to finance them a truck and make them a business owner. And uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. We need to get uh, people through the system and uh, uh, grow and our operators some way. But uh, yeah, some of those lower numbers are uh, people who are low on experience too. Okay, thank you. And along those lines, you. Uh, um, had mentioned the purchase, uh, the lease purchase programs. What are we seeing with those right now? Are, are, they, are we seeing an increase in them, or is it stagnant, or a decrease? We're seeing uh, we're seeing them grow pretty aggressively. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, towards the end of the year, we we hope to be able to try to quantify that. But I think we're going to find that at least anecdotally, what we're hearing is that people are having uh, continued success with uh, putting people in uh, lease purchase trucks and, uh, you know, making uh, owner-operators out of them. And uh, most of the people that I speak with at uh, the carrier level who have uh, those programs in place are very happy with the results and uh, tell me that uh, a lot of their drivers are uh, uh, very happy with the results. Uh, so I, I think we'll continue to see more of it. I think just because of the financing situation we're in right now, uh, it's the most practical way uh, to get somebody into a, a, to a truck. Um, no matter how much experience they've they've gotten, uh, getting a loan is a big challenge. So we see it growing uh, uh, pretty rapidly as we move forward. Okay, uh, I'm going to read you a couple of them here and. Uh, I don't know if I can clarify one of them, but we're going to try. But the first one is, is the flat pay since 2007 markedly different than wages in general? Uh, oh, I see. Uh, the plus or minus 5% of what they're making in 2007. We've seen wages go up in the overall economy for uh, what I'll call the, the type of workers that we uh, were talking about, the, the the technical classification at a rate of about two to three percent a year. Um, so if you use the low end of that and you assume 2007, that's five years, it's gone up 10 percent uh, for those people. So yeah, in our industry, unfortunately, that plus or minus five percent, uh, that's a, probably about half of what uh, uh, the rest of the economy has, uh, has found there. So that's pretty low. Okay. Now, somebody's want to know about the information for this webinar, and, and I think they want to know about the demographics of uh, your data. Uh, they're just asked, was it, is it based on large, small, or medium uh, trucking companies? Maybe you can just elaborate on that, that group of 350, what, exactly what they are. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have a, um, we call it a balance group. They're, uh, they're selected based on uh, their size of carrier, uh, of carrier, and we have 
uh, carriers are small, excuse me, as small as, the uh, smallest one right now is about 85 trucks, and uh, as large as, uh, um, you know, the biggest carriers out there are, are I think we have all the, the super-sized carriers represented. Uh, we have a good-sized group of uh, carriers in there that are in the uh, uh, middle tier, and we have uh, a group of smaller carriers in there. Um, and we can we can break those out. The interesting thing is, uh, it doesn't necessarily we we have never been able to predict what their pay package is going to be based on their size alone. So that that is an interesting thing about it. There are uh, some pretty small carriers that have some um, pretty good pay packages and really nice pay packages, and some mid-sized uh, carriers that have great pay packages and. Uh, uh, some large carriers that uh, you know have great pay packages, and some that have okay pay packages. So um, it's uh, it's not predictive uh, just on the size of the carrier. Okay. Uh, with owner operators, do you calculate the expense cost as part of your fleet comparisons? Would you read that again? I'm I'm not sure. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, and I'm. I'm, I'm thinking this may be in a, in a lease type deal, but with owner operators, do you calculate the expense cost as part of your fleet comparisons? No. No, we, we have some some of the expense items in there um, that they may be getting reimbursed for. I mean, we, we do track there that, but we don't, uh, uh, we don't actually try to do a uh, uh, estimated, uh, you know, profit or loss one. I think that's where that question was going. Okay. If I, uh, somebody, if I didn't, just correct me. Okay. Or we'll give you, I think we're going to give you your, uh, your uh, email at the end and if, if it needs to be clarified. Uh, somebody else is wanting to know, how do you set up a pay package if you're wanting to start hiring drivers? Um, actually, if, uh, if, if they'd like, if they email me, I'll send them. We have uh, all 64 categories for opera. Uh, company drivers, and I think it's 65 for owner-operators, and we've got them all defined. Um, so that when somebody gets a report and they want to know what a column means, we've got a precise definition. And that really will walk them through putting together a uh, pay package. So we'd be happy to send them that and, uh, uh, and send them a spreadsheet uh, with the columns already set up and uh, send them a, uh, uh, the, the definition of terms. They can put a pay package together like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to know, um, do you see starting pay for experienced drivers, drivers higher in the three to five years um, versus the, for three to five year drivers versus one to two year drivers? Are you still there, Gordon? We're going to give Gordon, we're very near the end of our webinar, we're going to give him a second to try to come back in and answer a couple more questions. And again, we apologize. Uh, hopefully, Gordon will be back in just one second. I'll go ahead and scroll down to the slide with uh, their information. So if you have any questions for them that we don't get to address tonight. Um, here are the email addresses. And as an attendee, you will receive a follow-up um, email with uh, the link to download in case you want to uh, listen to it again or share it. Great. Uh, Gordon, let's see if we get him back. We have a couple more questions we want to answer before we wrap this up. Give him just one more moment. I tell you what we're going to do now. I think we're going to go ahead and unfortunately we're going to have to end the, the webinar. We're going to leave this up for a couple more minutes with, with Gordon's uh, email information and hopefully uh, the rest of the questions you'll be able to uh, send to him and get them answered in the next couple of days. And again, we apologize for that. but. Uh, we're going to turn it back over to Cameron now. Mm.
All right. Uh, we want to thank you, uh, listeners, for making Overdrive your source for news and information on topics that affect you as a driver or owner-operator. We also appreciate Shell and Ryder for making tonight's webinar possible. Um, again, if you have any questions for the editorial staff or Gordon, uh, that information is on your screen. Uh, following the webinar, a brief survey will pop up on your screen. And we would appreciate you answering these short questions to help us gain additional information about how we can improve our webinars for the future. And with that, uh, we will sign off. Thank you again for listening. Good night.